darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness or gross darkness the peoples. Well, that is in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, right at the beginning. I mean, there are some positive elements to what he writes, but I want to focus on the age in which we're living, where there is gross darkness. Um, there's a cloud, a shroud of darkness over the spiritual eyes of the peoples, so dark that they cannot see the light. What do we do? Well, we have to shine the light. How do we shine the light? We are in Babylon. We're in a hostile, uh, an increasingly hostile, secular humanist environment. And that's um, putting it lightly. It's dark, it's hard, it's a slog. Well, if you remember there at the beginning of Genesis, that it's by the sweat of your brow. You will work by the sweat of your brow. And I think there's something in that. Uh, there is a place for prayer. There, there is a place for uh, closeting ourselves away, praying in secret, secret interceding uh, for so many important issues facing our nation and the world. But there's also a case for doing things. <clears throat> and I want to focus on one aspect of doing things, and that's working with our hands. So I'm not talking about going to the gym and just, although Paul did say to Timothy, keep yourself in a, a good physical condition. But there's, there's something the Lord has given us our hands to do things. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I'll focus on some of these scriptures shortly, but look at uh, Jeremiah's advice to the exiles. And in one sense, we are exiles in our own country. As I say, we're in Babylon. Uh, we're, we're not in the wonderful, you know, green and pleasant land that maybe some of us grew up in. Uh, uh, only a few decades ago, where you had, dare I mention it again, uh, good solid Christian assemblies, where you said the Lord's Prayer every day at school, where you sung rousing hymns of glory and praise to the Lord. Uh, we're not in that land anymore. What should we do? Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This wonderful new Jerusalem which was uh, being built and which has been promised by so many governments, uh, we've been carried away from that. What does Jeremiah say? Verse 5, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease and seek the prosperity and peace of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Okay, prayer is there. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I love uh, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found of you. Now, there are a number of scriptures that are uh, warning us. Uh, they're often in Paul's um, letters, by the way, and often at the end of his letters. Uh, and it's quite, it's quite interesting that I could read many of them, but let's have a look at a few. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, this is right at the end of verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And also in uh, Thessalonians, there's, there's a couple of, um, of wonderful scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business. In other words, don't be just a busybody, you know, putting your nose in, into everyone else's business. Mind your own business and uh, uh, to work with your hands uh, uh, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. That is so powerful, isn't it? 
You'll win respect from people if they see that you don't mind getting your hands dirty. You, you don't mind a little bit of toil. I'm not just talking about some sort of Jeremy Corbyn style allotment, um, but you build something. As Jeremiah says, build a house, build a garden shed, do, do something practical. The Lord's knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Um, don't just accumulate knowledge. Don't just pursue knowledge. The Lord's made us uh, with a wonderful um, hands that can be productive and creative. And it is very therapeutic. I found it throughout my life. I can't stand just sitting in front of a computer. I like to do things uh, practically. And then in 2 Thessalonians 3, there is a good um, warning against just sitting on your backside. And I, I totally advocate reading the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, spending a lot of time absorbing the wisdom of God's word. But there's also a time for getting up, uh, for sowing and planting, as uh, it says in Ecclesiastes 3. Um, there's a time for weeping, there's a time for mourning, there's a time uh, to be born, a time to die. We might come on to that. But I did say we're in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, and at the end of this amazing letter, uh, Paul says, in the name, verse 6, in the name of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we commend you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle. Paul was not idle. Paul was not only a missionary. A missionary doesn't mean that you just live off the fat of, um, let's say, a church donations so you, uh, and send out a missionary newsletter, good though all that is. But the great missionaries got involved practically. They built um, hospitals, they built schools where um, folks could hear, where children could hear God's word and learn about him. There was a lot of building involved. It wasn't just sort of, as it were, um, sucking the end of a pencil, you know, make, and writing a, a missionary report. You yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle. Um, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. I mean, Paul was a tent maker. It's hard work, tent making. He's probably doing it on a grand scale, by the way, and, and largely financed his own missionary journeys. Just think about that. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. This is all very important, practical stuff. Just like uh, Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 29, very practical. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help. Yes, don't muzzle the ox. A worker is worthy of his hire. Uh, and of course, pastors you know, and those who are working in full-time ministry need to uh, be funded. But, uh, and there is a right for such um, support. And as uh, Paul writes, and he knew all about working in wages in Romans uh, chapter for now when a man works his wages are not credited to him as a gift but as an obligation he says however to the man who does not work but trusts god who justifies the wicked his faith is credited to him as righteousness now he uses that hinge as it were uh, to hang a very important teaching that our salvation isn't by good works but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work um, it's healthy it's useful it keeps your your system uh, working properly and he says this look we did this not uh, uh, because we do not have a right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. What a model Paul is. And of course, don't be too intimidated by his prolific travelings and prolific writings, but it's a good model to work from. And I wanted to get to this important verse. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man were will not work, he shall not eat. I mean, my dad used to um, echo that often, often to us. You know, basically, if you, want, if you want your breakfast, dinner and tea, make sure you knuckle down and do a good hard day's work and it won't do you any harm. I'm just trying to find my um, a passage on. 
I'm stuck in Jeremiah and, and Isaiah. I want to just find my passage on, um, in Ecclesiastes, if I can find it eventually. I think it's Ecclesiastes chapter 9, um, where uh, this wonderful scripture, again, I'll be honest, I was greatly inspired by my dad, who, who was a very, very practical man. He was always building. And as soon as we were old enough to lift a brick as children, we lived on Ham Common, and there was a, a builder's yard next door, which has now had a, a magnificent house built on it. But um, we would be down there shoveling rubbish from one corner of the yard to another corner, lifting bricks, stacking them neatly on the side. I learned how to stack the, the three bricks on the end of each row with a little uh, lift on them so that the, the pile of bricks against the wall wouldn't all collapse. Uh, I learned all that at a very young age. And Dad would often uh, quote this verse in Ecclesiastes 9, uh, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, uh, do it with all your might. Isn't that a wonderful verse? But then it says this, for in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. You see, all of the, the wise man and, and the scoffers, um, scoffing our Christian life, they accumulate all this knowledge. Where does it go to? And certainly in their uh, view of the future, and of our destiny, it goes to a cold, um, purposeless uh, end when, when the u universe uh, reaches the heat death. And then uh, Jesus in John chapter 9, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, um, that he was born blind? Uh, that's not my main teaching for today, but it is, it is important. The Lord says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. That is a very powerful theme. You remember the collapse of the Tower of Siloam. The Lord's also um, addressing this question that are, are people suffering because of the measure of their sin? And you could say, actually, looking at the whole history of humanity, what is the point of the whole thing? And here it is, that the work of God might be displayed in us. Pharaoh, I've raised you up for this purpose in Romans uh, 9 or 10, um, so that I might display my power in you. Uh, Romans 11, uh, uh, the Lord says, I have bound all men over to disobedience and sin in order that I might have mercy on all, so that no man may boast, because uh, we're only saved by God's mercy. And if we are all bound over to disobedience, if we are all so manifestly sinful, so that there's absolutely no question about it, we can't take any glory for our salvation, even for our lives. Um, we are destined for death without God's intervention. So we have uh, the key verse which I was getting to in John chapter 9. As long as it is day, the Lord says, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Isn't that a wonderful so the Lord is saying, look, a night is coming. As I, as I started, darkness covers the earth, gross darkness people. And then you have the prophecy from Seir, I think it was, a watchman, what of the night? What of the night? And the watchman answers, the morning comes, but also the night. Let's not just uh, allow ourselves to fall into this delusion uh, this full sense of security in our Christian bubble, um, where there is light, where there is truth, where there is encouragement uh, from uh, fellowship, where there is an understanding of God's promises, where there is a sense of purpose when you get up in the morning, um, a knowledge of God. Let's not delude ourselves uh, to think that there isn't a gross darkness 
that is covering the earth. That even um, in that hour before dawn, you have the greatest darkness before the dawn breaks and the morning star appears. And uh, let's work while it is day because a night is coming where no man can work. And I can't remember whether I've read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, but here it is again. My dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Um, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Now that was after this wonderful passage on the resurrection of Christ um, and talking about the body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Now that's from verse 43. Wow, what wonderful revelation, what wonderful spiritual insights. But how does Paul end the chapter? Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour is not in vain. And that takes me back again to Ecclesiastes, to one of my favourite verses. What does a labourer gain from all his work? Ecclesiastes 3.11, I think. And the answer is, God makes everything beautiful in its time. You gain something absolutely wonderful and beautiful and something to really appreciate and cherish in spite of the darkness, in spite of what uh, uh, Solomon writes, that, um, that whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Uh, it's, it's a pretty morbid, uh, negative uh, perspective of uh, humanity that Solomon brings, by the way, based on his wisdom. He knew that it was a chasing after the wind. He knew that a human existence without the essential input of God's spirit in your life, of God's purpose in your life, it is a miserable, a vain pursuit. And that's why it's so important, Ecclesiastes 3, uh, verse 10, uh, verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Uh, that's, that's Solomon, you can't resist um, throwing in the stinger at the end of it. But the point is that uh, when we get up in the morning, uh, of course we should read our Bible, of course we should meditate on God's word. Of course, I believe we should watch. In other words, listen to what is in the news. Watch what is on the news, which we can do that they couldn't do in those days. Um, uh, read, read the newspapers, you know, uh, but um, with a kind of pinch of salt uh, and your tongue in your cheek, uh, reading some of the fake news that is out there. But in order, not that we could just get obsessed with the news, in order that we can pray. So the Lord said, watch and pray. Watchman, what of the night? I should be able to ask any one of you, what is happening out there? What is happening in this night? But uh, in order so that we can pray um, intelligently, in an informed way, we can pray um, knowing uh, God's word. So this is the point about Isaiah 60. See, darkness uh, covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Uh, now, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But we're not all Moses. We're not all Paul. Of course, we're, we're, we're not likely to be transfigured like Elijah um, or alongside the Lord Jesus. But if we do our job as unto the Lord, if we work as unto him for his glory, um, for a testimony, uh, not like the Pharisees, again, so, so that uh, people can see um, how 
how wonderfully righteous we are, but just get on with the job. Don't be weary in doing good. Make it an ambition to lead a quiet life. Um, you may, it may not be possible. I mean, I've had an ambition to lead a quiet life. I, I, I would quite happily just work in a woodwork shed and, and plane a piece of wood and see the grain of the wood, not, you know, sand it with this horrible sandpaper, but with a nice sharp blade that you, by the way, you have to, you know, clean and sharpen at the end of each day so that when you use it in the morning, you can see the grain of that wood. You can see the wonder of God's a creation just in a piece of wood. And by the way, when you plane a piece of wood, you can see the grain much more clearly than if you, if you just scrub it over with sandpaper. And of course, you should never sand against the grain. Now, I always aspired to do that. I, I loved woodwork more than metalwork. I found metalwork and plastic work just a little bit too um, utilitarian, let's say. But, but wood is just such a magnificent appear, uh, material. And of course, you need to understand the way the grain is going um, and uh, you don't plane where the grain is up because it will just, uh, you know, uh, corrupt the whole uh, beautiful, smooth surface. So I aspired to that kind of life, but um, the Lord sometimes has other plans. Man proposes, God disposes. And uh, you uh, can find yourself making a few comments, as I did in, in, in the workshops uh, when I was at, at design college. Uh, and before you know it, you've got a crowd of people around the workbench listening to your testimony and listening to uh, you speaking um, about the wonders of God's word. You can do it in any uh, working job. People are interested in your work. Uh, they were interested in my designs. I want to design a word. And, and that isn't a Pharisaic com comment. It's just a fact of, of history. Now, I, a National Design Award, um, BASF, it's a wonderful plastics, you know, a sponsorship I had and everything else. But in earshot, while I was sharing my testimonies to people who didn't know the Lord, there was a Muslim guy who, who was listening and didn't really like the attention. Um, and uh, obviously uh, me quoting my favorite scripture that no one comes to the Lord except by me in John 14. Uh, uh, verse six, no one comes to the Father except through the Lord Jesus, and you must repent. And I used to say that kind of stuff. So this guy, I sort of half saw him out of the corner of my eye. Uh, and as I say, I felt I was leading a, a quiet and peaceful life. But um, he got me on my own, out in the corridor, grabbed me by the throat, and put his hand up to me and said, you watch it. He said, he said nothing else, you watch it, you watch it. I've encountered that a couple of times, I'm afraid, from our um, folks from that um, religious faith. And uh, so the, my illustration here, or the moral of the story here, is um, y y we seek a quiet life. We plant um, our vineyards. We build our houses. We have our families. We seek to be a good testimony. but. Um, only the Lord knows. Once you speak about the Lord Jesus, he's a rock of offence. He causes men to stumble in their own, you know, happy-go-lucky existence of uh, eating, drinking and be marrying uh, on, on the one side. They resent it. Or uh, where you have uh, a conflict with those who say that there's another religion which uh, you have to uh, follow rigidly a, a format of obligations daily and annually and in your life before you, you know, can please um, uh, the, the supreme leader or, or who, whatever deity you're following. Uh, that uh, religious approach, which by the way reflects all religions and all cults uh, working um, uh, uh, to be saved rather than being saved by faith, uh, that is offensive to people. But you have to say it and hope that folks um, do stumble over the rock of the truth of the Lord Jesus and, and then look at your uh, testimony and say, yeah, th these people, they, they have something about them. They're hard working. They're not just sitting back and saying, well, oh, it's the curse of, of Genesis by the sweat of your brow and, and, um, and then just looking for, 
you know, government handouts and becoming dependent. Uh, the, the scriptures I've read say, don't, don't become dependent. Um, be dependent on the Lord. Don't be dependent on anyone else. Don't be dependent on, you know, uh, tax breaks or government grants or, dare I say, in education, free education. Um, you work hard. You make a living. You um, uh, become prosperous and you will be a much more powerful testimony uh, uh, when you speak. Uh, God's word. When, when people say, well, what is it that motivates you when you get out of bed in the morning? Why are you working so hard? And you can say, well, it's as unto the Lord. He's watching my every step. I'm accountable to him. I'm not accountable to, let's say, the authorities who, who you can hoodwink and, um, and be devious and, and, and evade taxes uh, from, uh, or or certainly in the sort of non-policing environment that we have in the UK, you can get away with murder almost and, you, and you'll get an early release. No, we're accountable to our maker, the one who created us, and he's given us instructions for life. So I would say, how then should we live? And I've stolen that a bit from Francis Schaeffer. And how then we should we live? We should live as good citizens. We should have um, impeccable um, character. Uh, we should um, work while it's day. We should warn against the uh, nefarious activities of the night. We should give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We uh, should not be idle Thessalonians. And again, I'm going to repeat this 1 Thessalonians 4 because I've majored on it. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. What a wonderful scripture we have. It's not just leading us to the glories of the eternal God. It's showing us practically here on earth, how then should we live? And I hope this has been a blessing to you. It is a blessing to me every day when I get up in the morning and we face various trials and we count it all joy. Mm -hmm.